Ever since I was a boy, more than 70 years ago now, growing up in rural upstate New York, watching Marlon Perkins on Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, I have wanted to be a nature and wildlife photographer. I did a lot of nature photography in my 20s and 30s and 40s, using conventional film cameras with interchangeable lenses, but not much wildlife, as I never could afford the big lenses needed. It was not until my late 50s, with the advent of relatively affordable, lightweight, small sensor, long zoom, point and shoot digital cameras, with enough reach to fill the frame with a small bird or badger, that I really had a chance to do the kind of photography I had always dreamed of. I was so excited by the possibilities that I wrote the book on point and shoot nature photography, which is still available on Amazon, and started doing workshops at birding and wildlife festivals all across the country. Point-and-shoot nature photography is mostly a matter of attitude. If you're willing to take a half hour to set your camera up for birds and wildlife, and then let the camera's computer do what it does well, deal with focus and exposure, it'll leave you, the photographer, free to do what only human eyes, human hands, and human hearts can do. Frame and take the telling photo, the photo that captures nature as only you can see it. At the time I wrote my book, there were still a lot of what were called point-and-shoot super zooms, or bridge cameras, on the market. These were, as I said, small sensor cameras. The sensor was only one-sixth the size of a 35mm frame, but that allowed makers to build in ridiculously long zooms, generally 24mm equivalent at the wide angle end, and up to 1200, 1600, 2000, even 3000 millimeters at the telephoto end, more reach than any conventional photographer for whom an 800 millimeter lens is a super long lens could even imagine, the kind of reach you get with a spotting scope, not with a camera. These cameras, as I say, were relatively inexpensive and had excellent automation and lens stabilization and were light enough to carry all day and made taking frame-filling images of birds and wildlife, macros and stunning landscapes easy for the first time. Unfortunately, the advent of better and better phone cameras has driven the point-and-shoot cameras pretty much off the market. No one has introduced a new bridge camera in several years now. However, some of the older models are still on the market, some are still in stock at online retailers, and a few are actually still being made, and they remain one of the best values and easiest solutions for the aspiring nature photographer. I'll put links to some of the super zoom still available in the description below. If you are just beginning your nature photography journey, there is no better place to start. And then there is another class of cameras that work well for the point and shoot method. They are the one inch sensor fixed zoom lens cameras with relatively long zooms from Leica and Panasonic, the same cameras under different labels, and from Sony. Because the sensor is over twice as large as a conventional point-and-shoot, these cameras feature much better image quality. But also, because of the larger sensor, they only have zooms that reach from 24mm equivalent wide angle to 480 telephoto on the Leica and Panasonic, or 600mm on the Sony. Still, 600 millimeters is enough for most wildlife and closer birds, and with the image quality provided by the larger sensors, you can crop in on a distant bird for even more effective reach. Of course, these larger sensor cameras are at least twice and sometimes three times the price of a standard point-and-shoot super zoom. Finally, the point-and-shoot method can be used with any modern, interchangeable lens digital camera, including the increasingly popular Micro Four Thirds and the mirrorless systems. You just need to spend some time with the menus, and often with the manuals, and invest in a lens long enough for wildlife and birds, at least 600 millimeter equivalent. A fixed focal length lens will do, but a wide range zoom is certainly more flexible, especially when shooting larger wildlife. And again, with an even larger sensor, you can expect to spend at least twice what the previous 1-inch sensor cameras cost when you add up the cost of the body and at least a couple of lenses to cover the 24 to 600 millimeter range. No matter what camera you choose, this is an introduction to the point-and-shoot method, specifically for birds and wildlife. 
I'll cover the settings I make to ensure that the camera's automation will do the best job for birds and wildlife in almost any situation, and why I make each of them. In future videos, I'll go over landscape settings and then special challenges and low-light photography, and I plan a few setup videos for individual makes and models of cameras to give you a head start in setting up your own camera for the point-and-shoot method. First of all, all my settings are based on the program mode on your camera. That is the P on the mode dial. This knob with all the little letters and symbols on it, it might be on either side of the viewfinder. Program mode used to be exactly like auto, controlling focus, exposure, and white balance automatically. But unlike auto, in program, the photographer has some control over where the camera will focus, what parts of the view it will use to set exposure, and some control over the exposure itself using exposure compensation and program shift. The program end of things is still true, but auto on today's cameras has changed dramatically. It might still be called just plain auto, or it could be called intelligent auto or scene select auto. The computer in the camera analyzes the data from the sensor and tries to match it to a particular type of scene stored in its memory. A landscape, a portrait, a sunset, a backlighted situation, lots of people indoors at a party, a sports scene with rapidly moving subjects, etc., and selects a program specifically tailored for that kind of scene, featuring the best balance of shutter speed, aperture, ISO, and even JPEG processing for that particular situation. Scene Select Auto, for the most part, will give you excellent results under a wide range of conditions and with a wide range of subjects. Unfortunately, there is no birds and wildlife scene mode yet on any camera. Oh, I take that back. Nikon has a bird mode on their point and shoots, but it's not well implemented. Most cameras have a sports mode, which you might think would work, but often the close focus is limited or exposure compensation is not allowed or some other feature you really want in your birds and wildlife mode is not there or is poorly implemented. Therefore, we have to create our own birds and wildlife mode. One of the main reasons for shooting in program is that in automatic, you can't use continuous shooting. And when you're shooting birds and wildlife, you never want to take one picture of anything. You always want to take a burst of pictures. On this Nikon, you have a choice between high and low speed continuous. Now from using the camera in the field, I can tell you that high speed continuous fills up the buffer really fast. You can only take about 10 to 15 pictures. If you leave it on low speed continuous, you get a nice space between the pictures, enough time for the bird or the animal to reposition itself. And you can shoot up to 30 or 40 shots before the buffer fills. My Sony has lots of options for continuous shooting. Low, high, medium. Again, I shoot in low speed continuous. That gives the bird or the bear time to move between shots. If you shoot in high speed continuous or even medium speed continuous, High speed continuous on this camera is 24 frames per second or movie quality. Then you get end up with 10 or 15 of the same exact shot. And that's not the purpose of using continuous. Continuous is for capturing sequences of motion or that particular little look or, or attitude that you want in your shot. Let's talk about focus. In auto mode, and even in program mode, the camera will attempt to figure out what you're trying to focus on. Sometimes it gets it right, and more often, especially when shooting nature, it'll get it wrong. First, the camera looks for and favors human faces. You may have noticed how good today's cameras are at finding the face in the landscape to focus on. 
If there is no face, the camera will focus on the closest objects to the lens, unless they are dull colored or low contrast, in which case, if there's something brighter or more colorful behind, they'll focus on that instead. Most of the time, it works fine. But when shooting birds and wildlife, which are often not the closest or the most colorful object in the view, or are partially obscured by foreground foliage or trees, or sport some kind of camouflage against a cryptic background, you want more control over what the camera is going to focus on. Some of today's newest digital interchangeable lens cameras have an animal or even a bird's eye focus mode. In theory, this mode locates the eyes of your wild subject, just as it would human eyes, locks on, and then tracks the eyes as they move in the frame, automatically maintaining focus. And you always want the eyes in focus. It does not matter what else is in focus in a photo of any living thing. If the eyes are out of focus, you'll not be happy with the shot, and neither will anyone else. My current camera has animal eye focus, but I shoot way more birds than wildlife. I have not yet owned a camera with bird's eye focus, but it sounds great, and friends who own them tell me that it does indeed work wonders. And if you own such a camera, and it works consistently, that is pretty much the focus job done. Just set your camera for animal or bird's eye focus as needed. If your camera does not have that mode, or it does not work to your satisfaction, then it's up to you to control where the camera focuses. In program mode, you can set the focus area to a small square or circle in the center of the frame. The camera will then ignore anything that's not under the indicator when attempting to focus. All you have to do is make sure that the little indicator is over what you're interested in focusing on when you half press the shutter release to engage focus. When the camera is in program, there will be a menu setting or a button press that will give you access to the focus area settings. You may have choices like spot focus or single point focus, or you may just have small area focus or center focus or even movable spot focus. This feature is implemented and named in different ways by different camera makers. But I have yet to find a camera that has a true program mode that will not let you restrict the focus to the center of the frame. And a reminder, the center of the frame is just where the focus sensor is. You don't want to take every photo with the eyes of the subject in the center of the frame. You can always half press the shutter release while the focus spot is over the eyes, or at least over the head, and then, without releasing the shutter hold, reframe your shot for the best composition. Or, on many cameras today, if you have time, you can actually move the small focus area to line up with the head or the eye, either by using the arrow buttons on the five-way control wheel on the back of the camera, or, if your camera has a touch screen, just by touching the LCD screen on the back of the camera where you want it to focus. Just remember, to put the focus area back in the center after taking the shots so it's ready for the next encounter. The focus systems in today's cameras are very intelligent. They employ increasing amounts of artificial intelligence to determine what you might be wanting to focus on. If you set the focus to the center of the view, they will focus through obstructing foliage and twigs. They will focus on the bright plumage of a bird or the contrasting pattern of a leopard's pelt and ignore the lower contrast stuff around it. In well over 90% of situations, autofocus will be faster and more precise than manual focus, even in the most challenging of conditions and with the most challenging of subjects. So, set your camera to small area focus and pay attention to what you want to focus on. By the way, a couple of tips. First, always, always, always half press the shutter release and let the camera determine both focus and exposure before you press down all the way to take the photo. This habit will improve your ratio of keepers dramatically. Give the camera time to do its stuff. Second, if the camera will not focus on what you want, don't give up on the first press. Release, half press again, and again. Sometimes it takes three or four tries before the camera figures out what you're trying to focus on. Then too, if you just cannot get focus, move the focus spot to something with higher contrast or more detail. The legs of the bird, the edge of a nearby leaf, the rock the marmot is sitting on. 
anything about the same distance away as your subject, and let the camera focus on that. Do not hold the shutter release down as you move back to frame your subject, as you would when actually reframing the photo. Let off. Get the camera line back up on your subject and half press again. Now that the camera knows about how far away you want to focus, you will generally get focus on your subject on the next try, or the next, or the next. After focus comes exposure. With active birds and wildlife, you will want a shutter speed fast enough to freeze motion for a truly sharp photo, an aperture where the lens is at its sharpest for all that fur and feather detail, and the lowest ISO possible in the light you have available for the highest image quality and the most vivid colors. Let's deal with ISO first, as ISO is the camera's primary way of adjusting itself to changing light conditions. ISO was, traditionally, the measure of how any given camera film responded to light. Today, it is the measure of how your digital sensor responds to light. Back in the days of photographic film, you used to have to choose your ISO when you bought your film, and once it was in the camera, that's what you had to work with, no matter how the light changed. Films were available from ISO 25 to something like 1600. Today's digital cameras have continuously variable ISO settings from around 100 to, with some of the full-frame DSLRs, over 500,000. For bright scenes, you can get away with lower ISO settings in the range of 100 to 250. As the light levels fall in deep shade under a forest canopy or dark cloudy days or getting on for twilight on any day, you'll need higher and higher ISOs, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 6,400. You might think of digital ISO as being more like the volume buttons on your phone or music player than different kinds of film. A certain amount of light falls on the sensor, whatever light the day and the situation provide. If it is not enough for a good image, you can turn up the ISO, which is like turning up the volume on the signal from the sensor, amplifying it so the camera can record the scene. However, when you turn up the volume, you get more noise, or digital artifacts in the image, which limits the detail you can capture, and the colors lose increasing amounts of vibrance and subtlety. So you always want the lowest ISO that will get the job done. Fortunately, Auto ISO is programmed to give you exactly that, the lowest ISO possible in any given situation. You are better off not trying to second guess Auto ISO. Auto ISO will allow your camera to capture images in anything from deep twilight or the deep shade under a rainforest canopy or even the dark of night with supplemental light, see the video on low light photography, to a bright sunny day on the beach or the savannas of tropical Africa or the snows of the Arctic. The only limitation with auto ISO is that as it gets darker, it will generally reduce the shutter speed rather than increase the ISO. This makes sense even on an overcast day if you're photographing people, but with active birds and wildlife, you may find that your camera is giving you shutter speeds that are too low. Too low is a relative term, of course. Speeds that are too low at the long end of the zoom or with a long lens on your camera may be fine at wider angles. The automation in today's cameras is good enough to take that into account when setting the ISO. And, in addition, the image stabilization in today's cameras and lenses allows you to shoot at much lower shutter speeds than any sane photographer would have used in the past. With the aid of even a monopod for support, or if you're super steady, you can get sharp shots down to less than 1 50th of a second, in most situations, though, I find that shutter speeds over 1 to 50th provide consistently sharper images, and I'm happiest over 1 500th. But wouldn't it be nice to be able to tell the camera to favor higher shutter speeds over lower ISOs? In fact, more sophisticated cameras will allow you to bias your exposures towards higher shutter speeds at the cost of higher ISOs. On some cameras, you can set your auto ISO to change more rapidly as the light decreases, and on some, you can set a minimum shutter speed for your images. I'm not talking about setting the shutter speed or the ISO manually for each shot. Just telling the camera you do not want it to go under, say, 1 500th of a second, or you want it to pay more attention to shutter speed than to low ISO. 
I find on my Sony RX10 IV, just setting auto ISO to fast, which raises the ISO more rapidly, gives me usable shutter speeds 99% of the time, without my ever thinking about it again. Even the Nikon point and shoots allow you to set a minimum shutter speed of 125th, which will give you sharper images overall than the normal auto ISO setting. Explore your manual and menus to see what options you have for ensuring shutter speeds are fast enough for at least some movement of your subjects. Make sure that image stabilization is turned on in your camera body or lens, and perhaps invest in a monopod. I use a homemade bean bag attached to the top of a standard monopod so that I do not actually have to mount the camera on the pod. I just rest the camera on top as needed, and it makes a good walking stick as well. That brings us to aperture. Aperture is the size of the opening in the lens that lets light through. It is labeled by a somewhat esoteric number that is actually the ratio of the actual size of the opening to the focal length of the lens, or an F number. Using F numbers, or as they are called F stops, has the advantage that a lens at f5.6, no matter the focal length of the lens, from wide angle to extreme telephoto, will let in the same amount of light as any other lens at f5.6. Today's lenses for digital cameras, unlike film camera lenses of the past, are designed to be sharpest wide open, at their largest aperture, smallest f number, remember it's a ratio, if the lens goes from f2.8 wide open to f16 or f22 at its smallest opening, you can call that stop down, it will be sharpest at f2.8. In the good old days, the wisdom was that a lens was sharpest stop down at least a few stops, generally around f5.6 on an f2.8 lens. But that is no longer true. Essentially, the smaller the sensor in your camera and the longer the focal length of your lens, the more sharpness you will lose as you stop down to smaller apertures. Shoot wide open as much as you can. And of course, that's exactly what auto and program modes are designed to give you. The lowest possible ISO, highest possible shutter speed, and the largest aperture. It is very rare when the camera will not choose exactly the right combination of ISO, aperture, and shutter speed for the best image in any given situation. Exactly the combination an experienced photographer would choose. You can trust it. You pretty much cannot outthink the exposure automation in today's cameras. The only other change for exposure when shooting birds and wildlife is to set the exposure area, the part of the scene that the sensor takes into account when computing exposure, to a smaller area in the center of the screen, larger than your focus area, so not spot exposure, but definitely center or center weighted. You want correct exposure on your subject, but not at the cost of a background or a surround that is way too light or too dark. Center-weighted exposure is designed to achieve exactly that balance. Again, there'll be a setting in the menu somewhere to allow you to control the exposure area when in program mode. On some cameras, you will be able to lock the focus and exposure points so that when you move the focus point to cover the head or eyes of your subject, the exposure area will move as well. Again, resort to the manual. If you can do that with your camera, by all means, do it. Of the things you want to control when taking photos of birds and wildlife, the only one that remains is white balance or color temperature. They mean the same thing and refer to how warm, emphasizing the reds and the orange tones, or how cool, emphasizing the blue and green tones, your image will be. I've never found the need to take white balance off auto. Again, don't try to outthink the camera. And remember, while you can play with each of these settings yourself by putting the camera in manual or maybe by using shutter preferred or aperture preferred program, there is no combination of ISO, shutter speed, and aperture that will give you a better exposure than program when set up as I have outlined it for birds and wildlife. Different, maybe, but not better, and almost always, in fact, worse. If you are already shooting wide open, then other than changing the lens to one with a wider aperture, or sacrificing significant zoom reach, or lowering the shutter speed to unsafe levels, there is no way you can get more light on the sensor in any given situation. 
Your only option is to raise the ISO past the point where it produces a usable image, or to lower the shutter speed to unsafe levels, and you do not want to do either of those things. Trust the camera's automation. You really cannot do better. And just as a bonus, if you allow the camera to take care of focus and exposure and white balance, then your images, image after image, day after day, will be consistently well exposed and sharp. You will not have to fix much in post-processing. Yes, you will still be able to improve every image in post-processing, but since your images are technically consistent, you'll be able to use basically the same improvements on each image, which means that in most post-processing apps, you will be able to use the built-in presets or quickly develop presets of your own for mostly one-click post-processing. So that's it for your birds and wildlife program and the first steps in point-and-shoot nature photography. Set the camera to program. Set the shooting speed to low speed continuous. Set the focus to bird or animal eye tracking if you have it, or to a small area in the center of the view so you can focus on the head or eyes. Set ISO to auto, or where possible, to a tailored auto that favors higher shutter speeds. Set the exposure area to center or center weighted or spot lock to focus point. Let the program determine both aperture and shutter speed. Leave white balance or color temperature on auto. On most cameras, you can save these settings to an onboard user memory so that you can just set the camera to your birds and wildlife program with a few turns and clicks. All cameras will remember these settings in the program mode until you change them. Make sure the lens is zoomed out to where you want it to start when you save the program, as most cameras remember that as well. Then, when you set the camera to your birds and wildlife program memory, the lens will automatically zoom out to 600 millimeters or wherever you're comfortable starting. I use exactly these same settings for macro work, though your camera may have a macro focus setting. If it does, use that. Also, check to see if your camera has a macro scene mode. If so, definitely give it a try. Often, the macro mode is biased for smaller apertures for greater depth of field, and add special processing to the JPEG conversion. You may or may not like it, but your birds and wildlife program, perhaps with the addition of macro focus, will always work well. Landscapes are a whole different subject. There is a video in this series that details my settings for landscapes. So maybe to finish up, a few words on who the point and shoot method is not for. If you are the kind of person who takes joy and personal satisfaction in mastering the machine or in learning to control every aspect of a complicated process, then point and shoot is not for you. You can figure it all out yourself or there are any number, way too many, professional photographers who will teach you their own secret formula, their own hard way of doing wildlife photography. But don't let anyone tell you that if you do not do it the hard way, or their way, that you're not a real photographer. The way I see things, bird and wildlife photography is already hard enough, because the real mastery comes when you understand the birds and wildlife well enough to be in the right place at the right time, well enough to anticipate behavior, to catch the telling moment. That's hard. That takes years to learn. If the camera can handle the technical aspects of actually taking the photos, I say, let it. I have enough to learn and to enjoy in photographing birds and wildlife without having to even think more than I have to about focus and exposure. Or to put it another way, I always tell my students that photography is not the floor routine at the Olympics. There are no points for difficulty. You get no extra credit for doing it the hard way. The winning score is the memorable, satisfying photo. No one is going to ask you how you got it, or be more impressed because you shot it in manual. That's it then, the point-and-shoot method for birds and wildlife. If you have always dreamed of capturing great nature photos, and you own almost any camera with more settings than your phone, there is nothing stopping you. Let the camera do the work. Set your camera up following these simple guidelines. Always half press the shutter release and let the camera finish setting itself. Don't give up on your first attempt to focus. Move the focus point and reframe if necessary. Let the camera take care of everything else while you look for the nature photos that only you can see and frame and take them. 
That's all there is to it, really. Point-and-shoot nature photography.